Hello everyone, Aimer back with another Mission Impossible episode review. We've gotten to this one, the Revival series, Season 1, Episode 12, called The Fortune. Now, if you've just been following my reviews for some reason, and not actually watched the episode, or if for whatever reason you haven't watched this episode in a while, whatever, I urge you that if you do not have a clear recollection of what goes on in this episode, please go back and watch it. Without divulging too much or falling afoul of any, you know, potential issues, shall we say, if you're watching this video, it, you know, on the site, from where you're watching this video, if you search for the actual name of the show we're watching and the name of this particular episode, you'll find it. And you'll also find most other episodes, at least from the revival, right here on the site that you're watching this on. That's all I'll say about it. Anyway, this one starts at a heavily patrolled estate in the Florida Keys. A woman watches her security cameras and sees another woman dressed in black being chased by guard dogs, turning on lights to help them and the men search. The woman is quickly cornered and caught, and we see it's none other, none other than IMF agent Casey Randall. Casey is brought inside where the woman's husband is watching the old movie Anything Goes, and Casey is given some sort of injection which apparently knocks her out. The woman watches her henchman take Casey away with a rather evil look on her face. Jim uses spy speak to get his disc player on a magnetic train. The mission. The couple is Luis and Emilia Barazan, who were dictators of their Caribbean country, El Conte, with Emilia being the real power, until Luis became ill last year and was overthrown in a revolution. The two ran off with the country's riches and took asylum in Florida. The IMF must recover the money they stole from the country so that they cannot finance a potential revolution. Just a couple of notes here. We get the usual warning from the voice on tape about what happens if an agent gets caught or killed. The secretary will disavow uh, their actions. That does come into play later. It actually does matter this time. Also, I'll note that Luis and Emilia Barazan are played by Michael Pate, who was in the original series. He was in the season two episode Trek as General Diaz. And Emilia is played by Barbara Luna, who was in two episodes of the original series, both as sort of a, a guest agent. She was in the season one episode Elena, and she was in the season four episode Time Bomb. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In the apartment scene, Jim tells the team that Casey was sent ahead to do reconnaissance on the Barazan estate, and we're told that we will get a guest agent, Shannon Reed, played by Jane Badler. We get a look at some neat glasses that Grant has configured to be able to send messages to Nicholas, and some hints at what's to come. Off we go to Florida, where Amelia bumps into rugged fisherman Max, and they chat for a bit. She seems to take a liking to him. Amelia returns home to find Jim and Grant there as an oil company president and his geologist, who are interested in helping the Barazans take power again in exchange for drilling rights in their country. Jim says he has a plan to create an image of a strong Luis that their people will rally around, and Amelia seems intrigued. Back at the marina, Grant and Jim give Shannon a device for later, and Grant is able to para-drop onto the roof of the estate to tap into its satellite communications, avoiding the patrol. Meanwhile, Jim prepares Shannon for an upcoming news broadcast to be pumped into the Barazan estate, and happens to catch a news story about Casey's body being found washed onto shore near Fort Lauderdale. For the time being, he keeps the news to himself, but Shannon and Nicholas notice that he seems a bit distracted. Shannon's broadcast, ostensibly showing footage from El Conte, where demonstrators are clamoring for the Barazan's return, but have heard rumors of Luis's demise, are shown at the estate, 
riling Amelia up. Jim calls and says he'll be over in 30 minutes with his secret weapon, giving Grant an opportunity to get into the car and hide in the trunk. Jim shows Amelia Nicholas's ability to become Luis by putting on a lifelike mask and says that with some help, he can learn Luis's voice and mannerisms. Now Amelia is determined to return to power and make her supposed tormentors suffer. Jim breaks the news about Casey to the team, and they are predictably shaken to the point where Max feels that he can't do his part, but Grant tells him he has to try. If he can charm Amelia and get into the estate, he might be able to get footage from the ubiquitous security cameras. Jim promises the team that they will nail the Barazons if they killed Casey, who he says was like a daughter to him. The next day, the Barazons meet with Jim, Grant, and Nicholas as Luis, and the real Luis scoffs at the idea that Nicholas can pull off the impersonation. But of course, Amelia is dead set on making it happen, and Nicholas demonstrates his skill, ripping off his mask for some reason. That seems like a waste, but whatever. Later, Amelia finds Max calling himself Jack Mills at the dock, and they chat again with Max signaling Shannon, who takes a speedboat and tosses Grant's makeshift device at them on the pier setting off an impressive but harmless blast and speeding away before Amelia's bodyguards can target her. Max, of course, saves Amelia from the blast and then gets invited to the estate for some pool frolicking, listening to Amelia's self-pity about being targeted by her ungrateful countrymen. In the IMF truck, they prepare for the main part of the mission by going over the steps for the audience's benefit. Uh, Shannon calls the Barazon's attorney and says Luis is coming at 4 p.m. to review his holdings, which is the time that the IMF is prepared to do their broadcast from the Barazon estate to El Conte. Grant gets the guards to help him with the equipment, allowing Max to get into the room with the security hookup and get the only videotape that is actually there, handing it to Grant outside. It's been reused a few times, but he's still able to extract an infrared image of Casey trapped at the estate fence. The Barazons are urged to view the broadcast from their security room, as Nicholas doesn't want an audience or any distractions, and they agree. From the truck, the IMF broadcasts a pre-recorded message of Nicholas as Luis addressing El Conte, keeping the Barazons busy while Grant taps into Luis's computer, and Nicholas as Luis goes to his car, telling his staff to take him to his attorney. They do, and Grant is able to get into the computer, but it asks for a secondary password, which he wasn't expecting. Through the glasses, Grant tells Nicholas to stall to buy some time while he figures things out. Nicholas does so, convincing his attorney Carruthers that he wants everything transferred back to his country in anticipation for his return. Carruthers says that mm, maybe he should check with Amelia, who has warned him that Luis sometimes has memory lapses, making Nicholas's Luis righteously indignant. Grant finally gets into the computer, sending Nicholas up-to-date exact details about the massive Barazon holdings. With no more excuses, Carruthers executes the transfer as the tape of the broadcast comes to an abrupt end, surprising Amelia, who rushes downstairs to figure out what's going on. Once there, Jim reveals where Nicholas has gone as the rest of the IMF assemble, with Grant showing Amelia the footage he's found and sent to the FBI, who will be able to indict her for murdering Casey. Amelia says their threats are empty. Jim grabs her arm somewhat angrily and tells her in no uncertain terms she's wrong. Amelia then sort of goes off the deep end, taking the podium and grandstanding, addressing her people and telling them that she, their dear leader, is returning. The IMF head away as Luis starts to appreciate her performance, but then grabs his clicker and starts up Anything Goes again, quickly losing interest at Amelia's rant. We end this episode with Casey being disavowed, and a final shot of the season one cast up till now. Mission accomplished. I'm going to give this episode a grade. This is a little bit tough because there's so much going on here, but I'm going to put it right, right on the border between A- minus and B+. Plus. It's got some very, very good things to say about it. It... it, it it's so difficult to talk about the episode itself without talking about all of the meta stuff that is around it, but I'll try. Just on the basis of an episode in and of itself, certainly what is good is Barbara Luna. 
uh, as as Amelia. I've mentioned before about actors and actresses who can make us feel things. And that is so important to any kind of TV show which is designed to entertain us. I mentioned that Barbara Luna was in two episodes of the original series. In those ones, she was not evil. She was actually a, an, an, an agent in both, ep- both of those episodes. One is an honest-to-goodness guest agent. One is an agent who was in kind of a bit of a wayward situation. And in both of those episodes, neither one of which I thought was very good as an episode in and of itself, and you can check out the big ranking list uh, to, uh, to, to see what I, I thought, I did mention that the only reason that those episodes were good was because of Barbara, Barbara Luna's acting chops. She made the episodes better. In one of them, Time Bomb, it would have been the worst episode ever had it not been for her. In the other one called Elena from season one, that was not a great episode. There was a lot wrong with that one, but she was great. And here in this one, it's the same thing. Without her or an actress like her that that really just gets into the part, is a little bit over the top, but but does the job that the character requires, which is to be an evil, power-hungry sociopath. She pulls that off perfectly. You know, I, 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 there, I, I don't know how else to say it. If you don't hate this woman, I, I don't even know what to say. Also good, Michael Pate. Uh, who was in the season two episode, uh, Trek, as I think I mentioned, as General Diaz. He's fine, too, in his role. He's really just there to be a foil to Amelia, and that works. So I don't have any problem with that. And really, this whole episode is just about the two of them. The corollary to that, which is something that is not so great, is that by necessity... You really can't have an episode without this being the case. Because of the way Amelia is, it makes her very lame and very easy to manipulate. Because it's very obvious what she wants. Like I said, she is an evil, power-hungry sociopath. Such people can be manipulated with the promise of more power. That's all they want. That's all they crave. Everything that Amelia does and says shows how contemptuous she is of ordinary people. You know, I'll, she comments so many times about, you know, I'll make them pay. Who are they? It doesn't really matter. Anybody who she cares to think about or name that, you know, isn't totally behind her is the enemy. And, so, so, so you have you have to have that if you're going to have a character like this, they they have to be lame and easily manipulatable. However, as I mentioned, she's completely engaging. There's nothing unengaging or boring about Amelia Barrison, and I wouldn't say that she, that she's necessarily a schmuck. This is just pure lameness, and so that means that you know it it it, it is what it is. Let's just put it that way. In terms of callbacks to episodes from the original series, the most obvious callback in this uh, for this episode is to the elixir from season three, where we also have you know a, the a, a woman who was uh, you know ruler of her country, you know with her husband as kind of you know the face of the leadership. Uh, Ruth Roman and Barbara Luna even sort of resemble one another, I think. In the way that they act, in the way that they act, in the way that they carry themselves, they were probably roughly around the same ages when they played their, you know, respective roles. So th- that that's definitely a, a callback. In thinking about the actual episode itself and you know its basic structure, this is essentially a pennies from heaven uh, plot where the IMF gives their mark exactly what they want just not in the way that obviously the market expects things to happen, with a distraction play 
that takes the mark completely off guard, right, and puts them in a situation that they totally didn't uh, expect. And so the, there, there are a lot of episodes that have um, that sort of thing in various forms. One of the most obvious ones to me, and it, you might think this is a little bit of a stretch, and maybe it is, but also the season three episode, The Mercenaries. In that one, you have a power-hungry and, and money-hungry uh, you know, a uh, guerrilla leader uh, who is just, you know, after gold, basically gold and power. And so the IMF, you know, gives him uh, the opportunity to get a whole lot more gold, all for himself. And then they distract him, uh, you know, while they basically, you know, take the pennies from heaven away. And and that that might be a good comparison to this one as well. And now, of course, let's get to the juicy part. All about Terry Markwell and Jane Badler and what's going on here. So when I look at this situation with Terry Markwell, and I think about you know podcasts I've listened to and things that I've read, and one of the things that I always remember in situations like this is from uh, a, a, a wrestling podcast by a guy named Jim Ross. He's been in the wrestling business basically all his life. He's been in talent relations. He's seen and he's done it all. And his, his biggest claim to fame is being probably the most adept person at handling talent relations, dealing with the actual talent hearing all of their complaints and, you know, dealing with all of their situations and that sort of thing. The most thankless job in entertainment, for sure. And one of the things that I've learned from Jim Ross in listening to him and his wisdom over the years is, it, he's talking about his business, obviously, but I think it relates to the entire entertainment business. When it comes to situations where there are the sorts of problems that happen on television shows or movies or whatever, it basically boils down to the two C's, as Jim says, cash and creative. In, these, in this particular case, cash seems unlikely. You know, contracts for people who are appearing on a TV series are basically worked out, you know, before shooting even starts. You get paid per episode or you get paid a salary maybe for an entire series for X number of performances. All of that stuff is worked out well in advance. So generally speaking, when a, a, when a character leaves a show uh, in, in the middle of a season or however it happens, it's generally due to creative. Somebody's not happy with the way that they're being used, how much time they're getting on television, you know, what their role is or whatever. It may, it, I'm sure it also can work the other way. When the producers or the writers see that, you know what, hey, maybe this, this isn't working out so well. If you think back to the original series, a similar situation happened, albeit not in the middle of the season. It happened at the end of season three with Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. And I discussed that in the final review for season three, uh, The Interrogator. And you can go back and watch that if you like. And again, that boiled down to cash and creative. Martin Landau wanted to be paid more. Well, there were reasons that that couldn't necessarily happen because, you know, the way Peter Graves' contract was structured. Barbara Bain was also unhappy about certain things. And so that situation just couldn't be worked out. Here, it seems to me, and I don't know this for sure, but it seems to me that this was kind of a mutual parting of the ways between Terry Markwell and the producers, the powers that be of the show. I'll tell you why I'll, I'll go through it, at least from my vantage point. I, I it, it, just as a, just to start that conversation, I reached out to Terry Markwell. She has a website. You can go look for it if you like. I tried to contact her through that website. I was unsuccessful. The messages did not go through, almost as though, you know, there's some issue with the domain or I don't know what, but whatever. I tried. 
she might be able to tell us something. I have not heard, and I searched for it. Uh, she has she hasn't said anything, and now it's been about thirty five years. So I can only assume that she doesn't wish to speak about it. That's I respect her decision on that on that regard. We only have for people who were involved in the show at the time. Phil Morris might be able to tell us something. Fowl Penglis might be able to tell us something. They might be the only other two because Peter Graves is no longer with us. Tony Hamilton, sadly, is no longer with us either. I would really, really love to know from somebody who was actually there. I'm sure that we all would. But here's, I mean, here, here's my evidence for why I think that this was a mutual parting of the ways. First of all, she actually got a send-off from the show. No other actor or actress who left the show got this sort of send-off or was even acknowledged in later seasons. In fairness, those other departures happened between seasons and, you know, the actor or actress was just replaced and, and, and they moved on. So, so, so there was that. But the, the writers and producers could have simply just put Jane Badler into this episode and written Terry Markwell off and moved on. But they chose not to do that. And I think that that is really telling. That to me is a big piece of evidence for the mutuality of it. It's very, very clear if you look at how Terry Markwell has been used in the episode that she was in. Other than the very first episode, The Killer, and in uh, the episode, The Cattle King, she really did not get to do a whole heck of a lot other than to just be a placeholder. She wasn't useless, but she, but, but placeholder, I think, is really the best way to describe most of her roles. She, to me, she seemed to be a fish out of water. I would just say, objectively, this is not a reflection on her as a person or as an actress. I don't think that she was a good fit for this show. I have read, I've seen a lot of comments, similar things about Leslie Warren. I don't necessarily disagree that maybe Leslie Warren wasn't the greatest fit for the show. There were a whole bunch of reasons why the producers and writers wanted her in at the time that she came in. I, and you can uh, hear my thoughts about that in the final uh, review of season five. That, you know, she had personal issues. She had professional issues. You know, the dynamic with the cast in her case was such that, you know, you know, she's this very young woman with a bunch of older men, and they were very, very careful about how they interacted with her and how they dealt with her on screen and off screen. And that was obviously a bit of a challenge for everybody, I'm sure. So there were different circumstances there. But at the end of the day, you know, everybody is just not a good fit for this kind of show. And this is not about her being the female agent at all. I have said this about many male characters on the show, mostly villains, because they're the ones who matter. Not everyone is a good fit for this show or any kind of show. Personally, I will just say that Terry Markwell is not in the Barbara Bain mold. Okay? The IMF needs a female agent who can be the uh, Barbara Bain-esque in the sense that she can be smart sexy, alluring, innocent, whatever is required. And my feeling is that that is just not the kind of actress or lady that Terry Markwell is. There's nothing wrong with that. There are billions of women who can't pull that off, okay? So this is not an indictment of her in any imaginable way. It just wasn't a good fit. By the same token, the writers and producers, I feel, did not do a really good job to fit her character and her abilities to make her presence stronger on the show. Leslie Warren also suffered from that. A lot of her roles were not really appropriate for her, you know, the way she was physically, mentally, uh, the, the way that she came across. So that's that. And I think that that's what I really need to say about Terry Markwell. 
Flipping that over, though, on the other hand, Jane Badler, I was so happy to see her again. She is a perfect fit in almost every way. Every in, in, in so many ways, the things that Terry Markwell is not, Jane Badler is. She is my favorite IMF female agent. And yes, on a personal level, that even includes Barbara Bain, who is awesome, okay? But my favorite female agent from the show is Jane Badler. She can be the perfect agent because I can also see her, like Barbara, being the perfect villain, too. If you think about it, you could picture that, right? If Barbara Bain had come back and been the villain, a guest villain in, in an episode of MI, she could have done it without missing a beat. It would have been weird to the audience, maybe, but she could have pulled it off. She could have made you believe. Much like in this episode, Barbara Luna does that. And we know that because Jane Badler had already established herself that way. She did it in the TV miniseries and then follow-up series called V. And in that one, she was a really, really, really scary villain. And she was perfect for that. And I think that that is what makes her perfect for this role. Right away in this episode, she seems to mesh with the team. She doesn't miss a beat. You can see, and you will see over this season and the next episodes, that she will be smart. She will be sexy. She will be alluring. She will be innocent. She will be whatever is called for. And I dare say, the more you watch her, you can see her as kind of the spiritual successor to Barbara Bing. She's definitely that in my mind. And I don't think I have to say too much more about Jane Badler because there will be a lot of time to talk about her as the rest of the Revival series goes on. So anyway, just to put a bow on this one, my grade A- slash B+, for the reasons that I've said, um, I would very, very much love to hear other people's comments with regard to Terry Markwell, Jane Badler, anything you'd like to say. My usual spiel to wrap this up. Thank you guys, as always, for watching. Please like this review episode. Please uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already so you get notifications when new episodes come out. And please leave your comments. I would love to hear what people have to say about this particular issue. Is there something I missed when discussing uh, Terry Markwell, her situation, her time on the show? Is there something you think we might be able to do to get more information about what happened here? Uh, because I think I pretty much covered it. I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot more to say, but as fans, you know, we're always hungry for information. So I'd love to hear your comments about that, about the episode, and about any other episode. Thank you guys again, and I'll see you next time.